Okay, team, final lecture that we're recording. Um, we've given you 10 kind of full weeks already. Um, my understanding, although no one's ever confirmed this, is that um, elective, <coughs> electives are supposed to be 10 weeks and core course is 12 weeks. Um, that said, this was a lecture that I really thought you guys would benefit from. Um, even though we had kind of bumped it from the, uh, the, the list, but it was just too important to kind of just throw away. Um, it's so abstract that it's hard to say, here's what you do, because the whole point of this particular lecture or base installations is that every single one is different. And what we want to talk about here is how to critically think about the different situations. Um, so this is just kind of a smattering of different examples. Um, most of ones we've done, but some are ones that we just know of that we think are kind of fantastic projects um, where we could talk about some of the hurdles the team might have um, faced. Um, so this is, like I said, standalone installations. So that would be things like art, um, which is the majority of what we're talking about here. I have playground equipment in there, although playground equipment does have a few of its own um, kind of uh, AISC standards. Uh, but they're kind of, they're not very explicit. They say things like use 4.8 KPA or 3 bits, 3 bits, 4 in their particular code. Um, but they don't really give a whole lot of guidelines. So what do you do when it's not a thing a kid can climb on? Well, it would fall into this category then. Um, so let's talk about some of the basics. Um, how do you know how to design it for strength? And so this is where I said you could go to, if they have it, a specific AISC guideline for recommendations or code, small standard. They're usually three or four pages full of all kinds of individual clauses that say refer to this, refer to this, refer to this. Usually they say refer to the building code for the most part, um, and it costs you about $200 to buy them. Um, but I can tell you that the majority of the time, if there is a surface for gravity loads, you would apply your normal gravity loads. Self-weight, dead, snow, and live. Live, I would probably go, if people can get on it, I'd go with 4.8 kPa. If there's a surface for wind, I'd design it for the surface of wind. Similar to buildings, if not, we've talked before about engineers referencing the Australian building code because it's really good. The U.S. has a good one for open structures, um, which Dave talked about when he uh, looked at fabric structures or tensile structures. Um, for, but what do you do for small things um, that aren't intended for people on them um, and you know that maybe a wind load isn't going to cut it because it doesn't have a big surface area? So that's where I would strongly recommend one kilonewton in any direction. Unless maybe it's a small thing, and we've talked about this before, um, that maybe um, 66 pounds, which is what, 0.3 kPa, something like that, just 0.35 kPa, or 0.35 kilonewtons, because um, 66 pounds is what is in the uh, Workers' Health, Health and Safety Act as kind of the limit an individual person can be expected to carry. Do people carry more than that? Yeah, all the time. But your boss can't make you carry more than that. <laughs> so a bag of concrete or a bag of sand that you buy from a hardware store would be 66 pounds or 30 kilograms. Um, uh, so we often use that as, as the measure of the maximum reasonable effort exerted by a person. So if, we, if we're trying to figure out how much a guard, what's a reasonable limb, or how much we can expect a guard to move, well, that's the next slide. So maybe when we come okay. back to the 66 pounds, my philosophy for a lot of these things is for strength, I apply one kilonewton because I think you'd be hard pressed to prove that you couldn't meet what might be building code standards. Um, but that's up for negotiation, especially if it's something that doesn't need a permit and people can't get on it. And this is a conversation I've actually been having right now uh, with Betsy Williamson from Williamson Williamson because we're designing um, some inter internal shelving uh, for a store. And we agreed that using one kilonewton for the strength design was probably a really smart idea. And then as a separate load case, instead of it just being um, like a factor or a ratio 
of the live load, we are, we're actually looking at it being less load for the deflection criteria. Um, I like this image here um, of um, City Hall uh, during the Raptors parade. Um, I was just saying to Dave, uh, if they fits, they sits. If people can get on it under the right motivation, usually often alcohol is involved, people will, or rapturous joy, uh, they will climb up on it. They will get on it. Um, so you can see here, how high up is this? I can't even, it's, I would puke climbing up there. A guy would be on, under the Yeah, yeah, there. it's over it's, six meters for sure. Yeah, it is tall. I like how you said raptors, Joy, by the way, that was good. <laughs> I know, it was the raptors. <laughs> <laughs> there's a few other things I want to elaborate on. One, this, we're going to talk about the difference between how Shannon and I do things. You know, when we're designing buildings, you design the building code, and that's, that's it. When you're designing these installations and designing art, um, there is no explicit code, and so we, everybody does things their own way and makes their own decisions. They're, they're quite harmonized. We, we don't uh, depart. But Shannon's using one kilonewton. I typically use three, 300 pounds, which is what, um, what's that, 1.2, 1.3 kilonewtons. The reason I use 300 pounds is because the, the, there is no standard that says how much that force should be. But ASE 7, which is the American standard that describes loads, has 300 pounds as a rung load on a ladder. And so that's the, that's the kind of closest comparison to me, is the rung load on a ladder. Um, so Dave likes to go international, and he pulls his random number from the American code. Um, I use one kilonewton because in the building code, explicitly stated in guards, which to me is an equivalent thing, uh, it's one kilonewton. Whether yeah. it's somebody standing on the rail, like so that's yeah, yeah. it's the I thought it was one point three down, no? No, that's the American one. Right. The Canadian one is one kilonewton in any direction. Uh, it's one point five kilonewtons per meter yeah, that's it. downward. Um, but because that assumes a whole bunch of people sit on the railing is what I'm assuming that comes out of. That's the thing. We're always trying to back backstory where these loads come from. Um, the other thing about designing things that are small installation um, scale is certain loads that are not relevant or not important in buildings become important. So mm -hmm. one of them is ice. You know, in a build, we don't design buildings for ice. Um, it's not that ice can't accrete on a building, it's just that relative to the other loads on the building, the ice accretion is so small that it's irrelevant. Yeah. But when we're designing um, catenary lighting over, a, you know, cable lighting over a street or something, ice, ice accretion is the dominant load. And if you're di designing something with, a, with small filigree, imagine a small filigree of, of uh, six millimeter um, elements. When you add 20 millimeters of ice all the way around the six millimeter element, the projected area for wind is seven or eight times the projected area um, without the ice. So the ice condition winds up uh, dominating the loads of things that are that are fine and filigree. And um, uh, power transmission lines actually do have that as a code requirement in their design requirement. Um, that you have to assume a certain amount of ice accretion for the wind. So there's the weight of the ice, but then also the wind projection on that ice accumulation that acts as a, a, turns into a tensile load that acts on the towers. The other one that, that it, we don't often consider for buildings, but we do for certain installations is, is wind shear. That's shear on a surface. So in a building, you've got a, a projected face and you've got wind blowing on the projected face and you've got a horizontal surface and you have wind shear across the horizontal surface. The, the wind shear is so small relative to the, the pro load on the projected surface that we ignore it. Um, but if you're designing a canopy or an installation that has virtually no projected surface and maybe is a, is a large area, then the wind shear winds up dominating the, uh, the load. So we talked a little bit about that when we talked about um, canopies and pergolas right. and things like that. One of the other things kind of falling into that is snow. Um, I do a lot of pergolas, and if they don't want a permit, 
they often don't have um, a roofing surface on them. I will often still try to design it as if they're going to come back and put a roofing surface on. And if everything just works, what a solid win. Um, I often design the foundations as if they were going to come back and put a surface in because it's, you know, peanuts in cost more to design the foundations for them putting the roof in. The structure itself, especially if it's wood, has like a 15 year lifespan. Um, so they're going to come back and replace it, but they're going to use the same foundations. For the building that is, or for the structure that is going in, if these are two joists, it looks like I know weird mushrooms, but if those are two joists that don't have a roofing surface on them, snow load, I don't just assume the inch and a half width. I'll often, you know, multiply it by the width by two, just because, you know, the snow is going to catch and kind of make its own little snowman head sitting on top of it. So even though there's no surface on that, I increase the amount of surface area that would see snow. There's, a, there's something in the American Code that gives you some guidance on the spacing of members over which snow will arch, right? Yes, and um, gosh, it'll arch quite far. So if, if your members are close together, I can't remember what, four inches maybe. I think that's. I think it's is. four inches. If it's if it's if it's greater than four inches, your snow will fall through. Um, but if it's tighter than four inches, you have to assume that it's a total surface area. Four inches is what I have in my head. I'm doing two right now where the objects are at 16 inches on center, so you know, it's not even a, a possibility that they'd arch over. But they will arch. They will carry a little bit of kind of rounded surface. Anyway, we went on a total, all the things. All the important stuff. All the things rant there. Um, so serviceability. Again, most of these things don't have a clear criteria. So you're trying to find what's reasonable. Um, again, this is often a very close conversation, specifically for the serviceability between the architect or the artist and the engineer. Um, so like I said, Betsy and I were having a conversation just this week where we talked about what seems like a reasonable, that's your phone, what seems like a reasonable amount of deflection. Um, I will often again start with, can I just, without anything extra besides what everyone is already showing as their hopes and dreams, does it work with kind of standard criteria? I often start at the highest criteria, just I check it out and if it works, no problem, end of story. If it is less than the standard criteria and getting, so that would be like L over 240 for dead and live, L over 360 for live, and H over 500 for wind, it's not even a conversation. If it's in this range between those, I'll say, hey, I'll, I'll stop and I'll think about what, what is it holding up? So if it's holding up something that can be easily damaged, well, maybe I'd want to have a conversation with the architect about what's happening in this range. Um, if it's not holding up anything that could be damaged, no problem. I'll use this criteria without even thinking about it. Um, I would be totally happy. I wouldn't even warrant a conversation with the architect or artist because if there's nothing that can be damaged it, uh, connected to it, these are totally real, realistic movements for these objects. You remember that the Shannon described the H over 500 drift criteria as being, as being um, about window seals. And if you don't have window seals, then H over 500 is not your criteria. Um, it happens to be the only criteria that we have and know that's published. Um, the L over 180 as a, as a sag and H over 100 as a, uh, as a, a lateral drift those are the, the thresholds that to me are visually straight and visually plumb. Your eye isn't going to pick something up until it's out of, as being out of plumb until it's more than 1 in 100. And your eye will see something deflecting at 1 in 180 <clears throat> as visually straight. Um, interestingly, L over 180 corresponds to a cantilever of L over 90, which is about the L over one, about H over, H over 100. Um, <clears throat> and and H over 100, um, seismic actually has a deflection criteria between H over 50 and H over uh, 100, um, because greater than that, and you actually start to worry about P delta. 
what's P delta, you ask, because you guys don't give a hoot. But if something tips over far enough, its own self-weight actually starts to make it tip over. So as it tips too much, we turn into that stability problem. We talked a lot about in structures one and structures two, for those of you that took the course. Um, so, you know, if you get over H over 50, it might work and you might be okay with that deflection, but maybe you have a stability problem at that point. Whereas if you also had a dead load up there, you know, maybe you have to worry about it actually trying to tip over now. Um, so if I can't then meet these criteria, I stop and talk to the architect or the artist about about these issues and say, what do we think we're comfortable with? What are we experiencing? For these ones here, if it's not in a straight line anyway, maybe we don't care. As long as, so if, if like Dave said, it's about seeing it visually move, if there's no reference to something else, you know, you probably can't see it with our crooked house. Well, it's at the bottom of the floor. I wonder, I wonder if they can see the bottom of our... Yeah, so you can see um, the bottom of our uh, our cabinets there. At the far end, at the far end over there, it's millimeters, and you can't see it, but down at the far end over there, it's something like an inch and a half. <laughs> um, but it's noticeable because there's something straight sitting on it. Yeah, without the cabinet there, it felt like a flat floor. It's yeah. fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so as soon as you have a reference that makes that need to be straight so much more kind of um, onerous. Recognizing that we're that I'm uh, just adding time to this and we're trying to get it quick. Um, what we try to do is if we are going to have large movements, we, we try, try not to make things level or plump. Um, so if we're designing a tensile structure, for example, with masts, I try never to make the mast plumb. I, I took the mast back because going from five degrees to two degrees, like people don't, people aren't going to register that as a movement. But if, if it starts plumb and it goes five degrees out of the plumb, then people will register that and be uncomfortable. Um, vibration. Um, if it's supporting people in a way that they could be bothered by vibration, then you should probably worry about vibration. And then that steel design guide that I talked about for both. Um, uh, stairs and did I talk about it? Or maybe it was just with stairs. Um, would be a place to reference and see how it can be applied. If there's nothing that can bother anyone, it's pro mostly vibration is about um, the comfort of the people on it. The times that you might need to go further on it um, are kind of small elements that could be impacted by wind, um, so a resonance wind problem. Um, so small fine cables that are exposed to high wind, um, you have to think about vibration, but often that is even beyond that. I've done it once. Have you ever done it? Do you look at vibration for your canopy structures, for your tensile structures? Occasionally, but not... Um, it's a quick check. You do a quick check. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We don't really have explicit criteria, frankly. There's a... Yeah. We know the, the, the frequencies that people are sensitive to if you're walking on it, but, but there's no guidelines for the sensitivity, people's sensitivity the, to the visual effect of movement. Um, for actual large-scale bridges, they do have strength criteria for vibration. Um, but those are, I've never done that. I've never gone into that kind of analysis. So now, mostly, because we wanted to keep this short, even though we're already at 20 minutes, how long do you have, Kate? What time That's is your next thing? Okay. So we can go for a little bit, and then we should probably eat food. But you'll probably get an urgent phone call between now and then anyway. So I've got a, I've got a, someone sending me texts that I went to university with asking about going to the drunk tank after feel pump. <laughs> <laughs> Important things. <laughs> Important things. Important things. Yeah. Um, um, so these are just mostly pictures of projects that Dave or I worked on, plus a few thrown in there of just really cool stuff. So this is a project I did. Um, uh, it's the, um, the, the Ceramics Museum. 
Um, so this was this was installed in 2018, I think. Uh, the there's an art community um, in Toronto that has gotten a hold of my name, and they've re referred a few different projects to me. So what's interesting about this one is um, so Sherry Boyle is a is a great artist. Um, she does a lot of kind of smaller scale things, um, and this was a very large installation she was doing, and uh, there wasn't, she didn't have a lot of knowledge on how things would go together at this scale. Um, the team she had assembled around her for things didn't have much experience in that either. So as much as it wasn't my wheelhouse to talk about a few of these things, I was the person with the most construction experience involved in her team. So I found myself kind of giving guidance on things that were beyond my scope. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing because we're professional engineers and you have to be really clear what is opinion and what is design fact um, because you want them to understand what you're not an expert in as an engineer. And you, you'd probably run into this as an architect as well. So this, um, I just showed you, this is my, my design sheet that I built for it. Um, I looked at wind two different ways as, a, as um, I figured out what my wind load was. And then in the code, there's chimney allowance. So if it's like a straight tube, and then there's also criteria for round objects. And so I kind of looked at both of those and applied them going around this structure. I looked at live load to two um, cases, somebody hanging off kind of the edge of it right here, which you can see is probably a really hard thing to do, but when you see the steel structure that's inside it, you'd see how that might be a possibility. Uh, and then I looked at one kilonewton point load of somebody pushing it over. Again, for strength, that seemed like a very smart thing to do. Once we made that work for strength, this one mostly just worked for deflection. Once we had built that in, the scale of it, once it worked for strength, it pretty much just worked for deflection. So this is what I ended up giving her. Um, again, for this project, because there was no building being built, um, she wasn't in charge of the foundation for it. Um, and then the building owners, so this was a competition for her piece to be installed, um, the museum actually contacted me and said, hey, since you know the most about this project, can you design the foundation that we're going to put this on as well? So that was kind of a separate project, even though it was the same project. This is a really nice detail, Shannon, where you've got, you know, base plates are always kind of cumbersome things. They got bolts sticking out. They're, they're awkward for, you know, tripping on and stuff. Um, to make a little pit like this, conceal your base, fill it in flush, then you can create the condition of, uh, of the, the post coming straight out of the ground clean. Um, so what we did for this, so she had the, the difficulty, there was two parts. She needed to be able to take this steel armature, encase it in her foam pieces and glue it together, and then put her ceramic elements on the outside. Um, and so that, those were elements where she really wanted some strong feedback from me um, about gluing and how do you attach these things um, and what glue will hold the ceramics onto the foam. So again, all of those are kind of way beyond um, what we can engineer, but I can give feedback. And so um, gluing the ceramic on, I had been involved in a few other projects. Um, and I gave her some feedback on what she could use to glue on. Um, and I also suggested glue one on a piece of foam and yank on it. Try really hard to pry it off, see what happens. Take a, pro, a, a crowbar to it and see what happens. Just to, because there was no real criteria and what she wanted was for it to last, I can't say yes, it'll last because that's not a real kind of uh, guideline or criteria, but I can give her a sense of how it will behave. The second thing is that this needed to be installed and then the bronze legs needed to be dropped down over top of it and then this needed to be installed on it. So 
I needed to give her a way that this could be built sequentially with maybe not um, with a team that maybe didn't have a lot of construction experience. So it needed to be as simple as possible. So the foam to the armature, I gave these, um, these plates that also had dowel rods to it so that they could um, uh, core out the foam and fill it with epoxy and glue it all on so that we had friction and glue holding this thing onto it. So we weren't relying on just one method of holding kind of the foam body onto the steel. Um, I designed a plug and a cap so that they could um, hoist it in onto site. Again, normally that would be a contractor's scope to do that element, um, but there wasn't really a contractor involved in this. Um, it was Sherry going out there with um, a steel person with a small fee to kind of to build this in place. Um, so then what I did was I suggested that this come in two parts. So this was, these were the legs and they had a flat piece welded inside here. So we made this big enough that they could just weld, reach in with the welder, but not so deep they couldn't get at it and welded this plate inside. And then this part of the armature, after they slipped the bronze legs down over it, this piece would come and get hoisted in place. They'd fill this up with epoxy, and then this was an almost perfectly tight fit to the inside of this, and they dropped it down in and wiped away all of the extra goo as it flowed out over the top. So this gave us a moment connection because as it tried to bend, we had a couple <coughs> acting between the top and the bottom, um, acting like this. Um, and then these parts were all welded up. So that gave them a way to kind of erect it. I see you're, you look like you're ready to say something. Oh yeah, no, just when you finish, <laughs> I was gonna say that, that this epoxy pocket detail is a really nice detail and is really commonly used for, for um, kind of blind connections. Uh, for small scale blind connections. Mm, use it in stone cladding, use okay. this detail. We've used it, I can show you other art installations that use a sim very similar approach. Yeah. <clears throat> you might have given me this idea. I think, I, I've used it a lot since then, but I think you might have given me that idea first. So here's another um, fun little project I did for Williamson Williamson. Um, this was uh, at, in Pilot Coffee, so this one's in First Canadian Place. Um, uh, this picture I was going to, I think it was just was pregnant with Duncan, and I was going to a prenatal appointment, and uh, I was like, oh, what a cool coffee table. Huh, I designed something that looked like that. Sweet goddamn, that's my table. <laughs> um, so, so I lined up to take a picture of it, and somebody came and set their coffee cup down on it just as I was taking the picture. Um, but this was really cool. They came to me and said, we want a folded piece of steel that looks reminiscent of a paper airplane pilot coffee. Um, so I built a model. You can see here, uh, I used one KPA as if it was a load everywhere. You can imagine somebody would lay down on this or sit on it, um, but the real one was a one kilonewton point load out here at the tip. Um, strength was easy enough to achieve. Um, deflection was a conversation with them. The harder part is that we were connecting back into uh, a, a concrete um, uh, column that they didn't know the exact conditions of. They, it wasn't flush, it wasn't perfect, so we needed to build almost a frame that they could uh, have complete certainty of what it looked like and where it was, that they could then adhere the table to. And also gave us an opportunity to spread that couple out. So here's what it ended up looking like. Um, you can see the coffee table here. Um, and then we had a few discrete locations where we connected into that frame. Um, and then the frame was actually anchored back into the concrete so that we had the option for some bigger anchors, slightly more secure, but that would get hidden out, and then the steel table could just be locally connected. So you can see that was on the HSS that went across, and those are the ones that came down. Um, 
This is a project, um, uh, it's for Chick-fil-A. Chick um, there was a lot of controversy happening when I was doing this. I ended up not completing the project. Um, some of it being because of that, some of it being because um, the, uh, there was a slight amount of disbelief that when I did this analysis, they needed a lot of concrete blocks set in this on planks to hold it in place. Almost, they almost needed to fill it up with sand kind of halfway up. And we did look at a way to make it get filled up with sand. Um, I would like to point out that this was going up in Florida in hurricane season. Um, and around this time, even in uh, Toronto, there have been several disasters of temporary installations being damaged due to high winds, sudden storms, high winds. Um, and so uh, I was happy to work with the team for alternate solutions, but I was adamant that they needed that kind of hold down weight to keep it from blowing away. Um, in the end, they decided to ignore me and have me not sign off on the project. <laughs> there wasn't a storm, so we haven't heard about it, but one of these days on something like that, there will be a storm, and anyway, here was the model that was built. Um, you can see that it also had large canopies, so essentially sails uh, that would um, uh, gather up a lot of wind load. Yeah, I'm just going to back up, back up to your, your pilot thing. <clears throat> I was thinking that about this this maximum human effort, 66 pounds. The case of beer is about 35 pounds, two cases. I mean, everybody's kind of, that's your comfortable limit. People can carry three, but comfortable limit is about two cases. About 70 pounds, so that's about right. A case of beer has a footprint of just about uh, one square foot, maybe a little over one square foot. So, so my new criteria for a table is going to be 50 pounds a square foot, which is two cases of beer high, because that is like... Which actually, is 2.4 kVA. 2.4 kVA, yeah. Um, which, which is exactly what you're recommending. So there's another... another. Uh, uh, this particular one was 1 kVA for this table. Um, I, I estimated that it would be not a lot of people. But you've also got a... You've got a uh, oh, yeah. on the tip. So yeah. it would be an either or to me. Yeah. Like um, I wouldn't put a point load on the tip. And the 2.4 kVA. Yeah. Um, and in fact, like I said, there's shelving units that I'm doing with Betsy and Shane right now. Uh, and what I settled on was 2.4 kVA. I looked at, so it had benches. Some of the shelving was actually benches. Um, and I looked at how many people could probably actually sit on this bench. And when I looked at 2.4 kVA over that bench area, it was about three and a half people sitting on yeah. the bench. So you and me and my mom and me holding Malcolm in my lap sitting on the bench, you know, like a totally reasonable yeah. thing for that bench. Um, so, what? are you thinking about my mom? <laughs> <laughs> so your mom would be in my lap, obviously. <laughs> we always joke that my mom, if, if, if I ever broke up with Dave, my mom is his backup. <laughs> um, my mom is wonderful and lovely. She's just like the sweetest person in the world. Um, so this was a project. I did this a long, long time ago. Um, uh, 2006, 2007 um, with North Design Studio. Um, who you guys all probably know because both partners work at U of T as well, uh, both props. Um, this was a really cool art installation um, that the interesting part was is that this was being connected down uh, in, the, um, in Cleveland in Mall B. So um, the malls are really just big concrete um, or big, big open areas, but this one actually had um, structure underneath. So underneath here is parking garages, I believe. 
um, even though it looks like a big garden park up on the surface. Um, so we were given very explicit criteria of what we could not um, exceed as point loads for these point bases. So sometimes we're making up the criteria, sometimes we're given explicit instructions by another team. And this was one where we were given explicit instruction by another, another team of what we could not exceed. And that came from drawings from the base building engineer. I forget when it was built, it was something like the 70s, but it had a point allowance on it. And it's something that we learned to build in for certain outdoor facilities um, that might be uh, reused. So, Young um, uh, and Dundas Square. Um, the installations you guys did in Young and Dundas Square, you have, you maybe don't even know this, because at a certain point, um, we were getting so many calls about um, what, what they could do. Each time they had an event, they were like, can we do this? Can we do this? What about this? Can we do that? So finally, we just said, "Here's what you can. Here are the loads you can have. Now, now see. You check and see if you've exceeded these loads." Well, and the brilliant engineers that we are, we lost five thousand dollars a year worth of billable, billable fees. <laughs> <laughs> this is interesting. The um, um, this this is tumbleweed, right? Like these these things are they weigh nothing and they're exposed to wind. Holding them down was a much bigger challenge than holding them up. Yes. And uh, and we face this often that that ballast becomes the requirement. Ballast and anchorage become um, can become the major um, design element. Design elements exactly. Which is what happened on the the Chick Fil A. Project yeah. they, and they were they didn't they didn't like that idea they didn't want it they felt that it could just be plopped in place um, you know having small kids a friend of ours had a bouncy castle that they loaned us for a few weeks in the summer and on a windy day that thing can certainly move around um, so uh, uh, um, yeah ballast can be a real a real oh well even this week. I have um, inflatable penguins up for Christmas decorations, and on Monday we had the big windstorm, and here in Fort Hope we got hammered. Um, half of the town had no power for half the week. Um, we actually, considering we're right on the water, made off pretty well, uh, but I went outside and one of my penguins was attached by only the electrical cord, blowing in the wind like a helium balloon, like I had to actually grab it out of the air and pull it back down. Um, and it had some ballast, but clearly not enough. You're gonna have to start ch stop chatting with your friends because it's uh, something I, you you need to talk about. Yeah. Mark Sintoon is reminding me of the time he lost his tooth outside the pub in Montreal. <laughs> um, important stuff. I, I I'm just putting that we're recording this in my calendar, so people quit bugging me. Um, <laughs> So this is a sculpture, Safe Hands, um, by Ron Arad. There are, you'll see that there, there are kind of two major strategies, just, just like there are with, with um, biological organisms. We can have exoskeletons and, en and endoskeletons. This is an endoskeletal structure. So the, um, um, the, the outer tube, the crushed stainless steel cans are cladding, they're not, uh, they are not actually structured. And inside this, there is a very heavy um, uh, circular pipe. Um, and, and as Shannon was describing in her Sherry Boyle structure, this thing came, um, much of the engineering was about the process. Like sure, it's got a load on it, but it's a cantilever, that's a simple thing. It, um, it's very tall and slender, so it's so it's subject to <coughs> wind-induced vibration. Even that's a relatively simple calculation. You can see it does get very, very close to the building, so so we were very sensitive to the fact that it, making sure that it doesn't buff it against the building. Um, but the the clever engineer came about um, the the assembly details. How do we put this thing together to um, diminish the endoskeleton so people can't tell that it's there even though the, the kind of cans are cracked 
Um, and as, Sher as Shannon had designed this lug for picking up her Sherry Boyle sculpture, we designed a bracket for this one. Um, we had to do very precise calculations about where the center of gravity was and design a bracket that would cantilever off and give us a pick point directly above the center of gravity so that the crane could lift these things up and they would hang true and, uh, and line the whole, or line the flange, connection flanges up uh, with one another. The other cool thing on this one that you guys were involved in was actually the cladding. Oh my gosh, I forgot about that. We have, we have a video, I'm sorry that we didn't put it in here. Yeah, we were asked by I can, the, I can upload it to them. Is it, in, yeah. is it on YouTube or do you have it as a file? Well, I have it as a file somewhere. So we can, I can upload it to Quercus yeah. for them. So do you know where it is? No, but I'll find it. Well, I, was, I could just go to it and we can watch yeah. it right now, but also upload it. Yeah, I it doesn't have to be in, okay. Yeah. Um, so the, the fabricator, you know, these, these um, you know, 1500 millimeter diameter stainless steel cylinders were, were crushed in a hydraulic press to, to create this image. And the fabricator wanted to have the ability to predict what they were going to look like. And he also wanted to know how much force is it going to take. And uh, so we did a simulation um, using SolidWorks of the, of the crushing process. And it really is amazing how accurately it predicted the, uh, the crush pattern. So we will give you that. And it, it seems like that should be easy, but if you've ever actually tried to crush a beer can or a pop can, um, it doesn't necessarily do it where you want. You often get all of the crushing happening in one spot, or you get a part that bends in and then it pokes out and it's just a sharp line and it folds over. They wanted to control the crushing so that they got a pattern. They didn't just want it all to crush at the bottom or bend over. They wanted something that looked crushed. It's like, it's like trying to draw something that looks like a kid drew it is really hard. <laughs> yeah. They wanted to make something looked crushed that what your mind registers is crushed, even though it's not necessarily the reality of what crushing a can truly looks like. And in fact, even in fabricating it, he had to, he, he didn't just crush them, he had to walk around the perimeter, load it up, and then tap it, and initiate the buckling um, around the perimeter. Or else it would have all failed dramatically in one spot, yeah. probably. Yeah. We don't have the bottom image. The bottom image is the one that's really cool. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Um, so I can add some more images to this. And you had a, a demo piece in your office forever. I, I probably still do if I still have an office. <laughs> <laughs> it was before you guys moved locations. It might not have made it. No, I do, I do still have it. <laughs> um, that's, if we had a full-size one, that would be an amazing fire pit. That um, would be an amazing fire pit. This is an interesting one. So this is this is Tatsunishi did this installation. It was a temporary installation, the statue of Adam back on University Street, which you guys presumably recognize. And um, and we had to calculate how we could meticulously balance all of that stuff on top of um, Adam Beck's head and keep it from falling off in a windstorm. Um, obviously, I'm being facetious. It's not really balanced up there. That's an illusion. But this is... Um, this is really talks to point of view. So from the north, looking south, it was critical that there be no evidence of any kind of supporting structure. But obviously we needed a supporting structure. Um, we couldn't put literally balance this stuff on, on uh, Adam Beck's head. Um, but from the south, the structure was all utility. It was just a big framework. It had some ballast. It was big wide flange beams that were welded together that all came out to create. But a little finger out there that was torsionally rigid, uh, an HSS, and a big long needle of solid steel um, up the middle. And then everything was threaded onto it. So, so point of view. From, from the north, it was, uh, it was a, a grand illusion, completely invisible. From the south, it's it's just a, a utilitarian structure. Um, <clears throat> so this is one that I did again, probably two thousand seven, two thousand eight. Um, at the time, it was probably the thing I really want to talk about with this is that 
What seems like the small, simple models, the small, everyday objects, can be the most difficult to engineer. The loads are so small and the capacities of these things are so small that what this really is, is um, a ton of little tiny rods going around making the shape of this vessel. Um, that actually has water flow out of it as a fountain system. Um, at the time, this was the most complex model that my software had run. Um, so, you know, massive buildings were less kind of um, demanding of the software than the, the thousands of small elements, because each of this was small, discrete elements trying to make the shape. Um, in the end, we needed a framework inside it to resist the loads. We started off trying to see if we could do it with nothing inside it. Um, uh, in the end, we needed a framework inside, which we were reluctant. We, we didn't want to bring that as the solution. We felt like failures, you know, we can't do it without some internal framework. Um, and uh, the artist said, oh, no problem. We're running piping up anyway. So we, as long as it's not too visible, we don't mind. Um, so very graciously, we were able to add some kind of supporting steel within this system. Um, but, you know, something that I want to point out, that the small things that seem like they should be easy can be the most rigorous from an engineering perspective. Or um, maybe not even um, what we would classify as normal engineering. So for you, that um, safe hands sculpture, the crushing, you guys probably spent the majority of your time analyzing that crushing. Yeah, that's uh, true. Um, hours and hours and hours and hours analyzing that crushing because it needed finite element analysis. Um, it needed um, somebody that understood complex software. It needed complex software, so software that costs you know thirty, forty thousand um, uh, dollars plus plus service like maintenance fees. Um, and then we had to develop a technique. And then develop a technique. It's not, there wasn't the crush can button on the software, obviously. Yeah. So those things that seem intuitively like they should probably be the easiest, if you ask someone to engineer it, can end up being the hardest or the most expensive part of the engineering fees. So this was a fun one um, that, that I did for Nathan Whitford, an, uh, an artist. So this was a Nuit Blanche installation hung from under the gardener. Um, there was two parts to it. Um, he needed to know, can we hang it from the gardener? Um, and he had said, you know, I hear there's a team working on under the gardener stuff. If we're lucky, maybe we could reach out to those engineers and they would give us some of their information and let us know kind of what point load range we're in. And I was like, ah, luckily, I happen to know the engineer that was working on that stuff. Um, and I had full access to that. So, you know, just as a boom, um, they got that information very quickly and very easily, like with no phone calls. I was able to just kind of open up the spreadsheet and take a look. Um, the second part, um, again, this comes back to every project being different. And when you're working with um, um, an artist or an architect to doing these small scale things, that the um, understanding of the scope becomes very interesting. So, you know, he wanted to know how to build this. Um, and so I was able to give him sizes um, and ideas, but ultimately when he started trying to build it and put it together, he came back to, well, could we just run something through conduit piping? Um, and that's where the difficulty came, where it was, um, I don't know anything structurally about conduit pipe. You would think, great, you can go into Home Depot and buy conduit pipe, but it doesn't have a standard for structural information on what loads it can resist, you know, how will it crush, how will it buckle, what's its stiffness, what's its tolerance range. Um, and to go down that path for something that should have been two or three hours of engineering, you can spend thousands of dollars going down that path, which for something like Safe Hands, which was a massive installation next to a key building in the city, they had the fees for that. Something like this, you know, the engineering fees for this were probably $500. Um, 
Uh, and so there wasn't room for that. So this became more an exercise, acknowledging that there was the hanging it from the gardener aspect. Um, this became a lot about feedback. Um, you know, is that stable? Is there a load path there? And then if there was, my recommendation was, okay, try to crush it. If if a person is about this load, get someone to stand on it. Does it work? Or put it in a, a, a clamp, for example, um, and see what happens. And so that became kind of the design feedback exchange. It was a temporary installation. There was no real load requirements. Um, and then we talked about, well, what if somebody hangs off of it? Um, and we found that somebody hanging off of it was um, beyond the capacity of what he wanted. I told him what it would take for somebody to hang off of it. He, he said, well, that ruins the whole art piece. And I said, so don't, don't design it for somebody to hang off of it. Um, you know, design this connection for somebody to hang off of it. But, you know, have somebody standing there to say, don't hang off of it. It was a one-night installation. Um, that was cheaper than, than trying to design it for somebody hanging off of it. Um, and so that kind of, and, and if somebody hung off of it, it wasn't a life safety. We weren't going to pull down chunks of the gardener. Um, this would deform, and that would be the end of the story. Somebody, somebody wouldn't die because of that, um, because of their stupidity to decide to hang off of this light installation. You know what? I, um, I remember doing this, and I, I don't remember what those those cables going vertically are. But I remember that we, you and I, talked a lot about how do you carry the weight of this thing, and you just perceive that the weight's got to go up, so suddenly we have to hang it from the beams. And at a certain point, we realized that this thing is very light, um, and um, if we if we just run a horizontal strap around the the um, the big columns of, of the the gar right. gardener bent, and load that horizontal strap just like a tennis string or something, um, the uh, we would not overcome the friction. It won't slip down, and. Um, and the, the, the big columns could take the take the inward force. So it's a, it's a load path we never ever use. But when you're yeah. hanging something light, and it was it was reliable and easy, right? Because because these um, polyester and nylon straps were were accessible from the ground. We could install them with ladders. So in the end, they did install it that way, but part. He wanted the illusion of it being hung. So this actually became the easier way for them to install it. And you can see it was banded, or not banded strapping, it was come alongs essentially. I yeah, believe I got them, yeah, yeah um, I got them to use heavy ratchet straps. And so that meant they could tension it just by somebody doing that. Um, and then they lit up these cables that weren't really doing anything. They were more kind of just there. I didn't design those. I didn't. I, that was in the original design, um, but he he ended up liking them, and yeah. so they stayed in the design. This is the Canada Building Trades Monument. Uh, Shannon's detail um, for um, Sherry Boyle's sculpture with the epoxy pocket is the same detail that we used here. Um, so these are granite. These are are machined or milled from solid pieces of granite. And there's a stainless steel pin that comes out the bottom and, and into a hole, and epoxied into a hole in the concrete slab. Um, did you take the granite? Is there something going all the way up through the granite? Or did you just have like a plug in the granite that you epoxied into the granite and then epoxied into the ground? Into the, exactly that. You know, it, it probably goes this far into the granite. We had to get far enough into the granite that we were anchoring into a piece with some solidity. And in fact, we made sure that there wasn't epoxy within something like 150 millimeters of the bottom. So that so, you didn't accidentally overload. That's right. The, the, the part at the bottom where, where the, uh, the stone got a little bit thin. So they put epoxy here, from here to here, so that if epoxy was in here, and as it tried to bend over, it would bear it as a couple between here and here, and you could have broken that piece of granite. So they made the couple here and here. Yeah. Um, how did you determine the strength of your granite? What did you use as guidelines for your granite? Uh, I don't recall. Or did you follow the similar guidelines from um, stone cladding, for it's, example? Yes. I think you had been doing that stone project, and okay. 
And it was one of those things that, that it was not, you know, we it didn't worked. get testing or anything. It was just the stresses were very low and we weren't too worried yeah. about it. Yeah, for something that has a capacity of 100 MPA and you've got stresses of 2 MPA, you can just kind of say, all right, we good. Yeah. We cool. And back yeah. away from the problem. Like, it's just not, it works by inspection at that point. That's right, yeah. So it was, it was really, as you said, it was the ten, tensile stress and that, and that lateral Hi, point right at the bottom. <laughs> you go play with that Play-Doh. That's a good chunk of Play-Doh. <laughs> Oh, no, 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 that'll break, that'll break the window, buddy. Go play with the play on the table. The much loved, Three Points Where Two Lines Meet by uh, Young and Giroux. Um, it's, the, it's the art installation people love to hate. That's right, yeah. And, and there are lots of people who, who, who really do love, love it. it. Yeah. Um, the, the, uh, uh, this is one of those projects that looks so deceptively simple. Um, it's all big trusses, triangulated. How hard could it be? Looks like you should be able to support a building on that. Yeah, but uh, but boy, all the little, you know, this this is one of those things. Every time something almost touches and then misses, um, you wind up with a real structural challenge. So working around that pole, for example, look, you see where the do not enter sign is, and there's a gap. This one right here. Oh, that one. There's a gap in the truss. Um, or, or look at this element here, this little mask that we had to hang off the truss. So that's discontinuous. That's not the column that keeps going. That's a little mask hung off the side of the truss to carry hydro. Um, this one wound up being uh, deceptively challenging. Um, and we, we took on the role of um, the, the geometric shop drawings. It's something with complicated projects that we often do that we don't do shop drawings because we don't want to um, take back the means and methods control from the contractor. So we don't design their connections or wells, but we will do a geometric shop drawings so that they don't have to work to worry about any dimensions. The geometric it's, resolution it's all that. worked out. Yeah. I gave them my uh, complex geometry. Oh right, yeah, okay. So you know that's that complex geometry resolution package that yeah. takes away kind of a, a huge portion of what you would have to re reproduce in 2D yeah. and to lead to the possibility of misinterpretation between the, the fabricator and the design team. Instead, they're getting something perfectly resolved and then you put the forces on and they make sure they work for the forces. Yeah. So we did not do this, although you are currently working on a project in Halifax for Wolfgang Buttress. That's right. The, one of the, I mean, there's a number of interesting things about this. So, you know, this, this is an example of, of a highly filigreed structure. So, um, so one where it would have been dominated by wind and ice accretion. Um, uh, but this is, you know, it's, it's advanced computation that makes things like this possible. And it's tremendously important to Wolfgang Buttress ideologically that it be optimized and um, we went into this this project in, in Halifax kind of knowing that but not really understanding that every member had to be at 90 percent utilization and and so as as you change a member to to reduce its section to get to 90 percent utilization or the or worse when you go the other way you increase it to get it to work now it picks up more wind you have to analyze it again and um, and so it's statically indeterminate. That's right. Um, as you change, as you increase stiffness of various elements, they attract more load, which means you have to reanalyze it because some other parts lose other load and it moves over here instead. And it, and it also you project you, you pick up more wind, right? Like it gets bigger, so you yeah. pick up more wind. That's true. Um, and uh, and so it, it's I think. That is probably the biggest model that we have done. Not this since, one, but the one in Halifax. The one yeah. in Halifax since uh, since your your picture. Oh, there's been a few more in there, but um, the the one in Halifax is. At one point, it was taking two days to run yeah. the analysis. Just the post processing. Just the post processing. For more than two days. Um, yeah, it was it was a uh, it's a crazy crazy process. 
This is this is um. These uh, these I think these are some of the most beautiful things. I I haven't seen one personally, and uh, I I'm. I hope it's not just that they're great photographs. Like I hope that it is truly this stunning to be there and experience it in person. I think they really are, and and uh, um, and it helps that Janet Ackerman is such a lovely person. Like uh, just lovely and humble and and friendly and. Um, anyway, there's some very interesting things about these. They're tensile, of course. Um, have you have you engineered one? No, we we did a pursuit with her, but she was unsuccessful on that one. Um, so you can see the top left image. Um, the net is suspended from a, a, a sort of a classic tensile cable net. These are synclastic forms. Um, so synclastic means that they're convex in, in both directions or concave in both directions, which means they can't remain rigid in the absence of an external load, um, which is why they're not rigid. So they're, they're very, very soft um, and, uh, and really dynamic. They're, you know, they're moving beautifully in the wind. But they're not just a simple net. Like, does she... They're net material, or is it is it like a fine steel mesh? No, it's net. It's actually these are at least the early ones. I don't know now, but the early early ones were hand knotted by fishermen. And is anything put in them to give them like a slight rigidity? As I imagine, you know, hanging a string, it's going to almost go into a V, not a U. And these are all forming these beautiful synclastic forms. So is there like um like you know, if you're doing art, arts and crafts with string, you might like dip it in glue and wrap it over a balloon. Is yeah. there anything like that on it? No, it's just a self weight. Now she may she may weight them. I don't know. I wouldn't be surprised if she weights them for effect. Um, but you can see in this in the, the top right, she's pulled up the middle. Yeah. Um, so I, the, they really are just the natural shape of the. And in the know, wind, yeah. not like on a windy day, this must just go whoop, sideways. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, they're really dynamic. Um, this this is art by, by Ron Barrett, who's a Canadian artist. Um, you guys might recognize the sculpture in front of 230 College, which is not, no longer there. It's no longer there. there. I, so it's in the collection Some of somewhere. you guys, yeah, would have been still... I can't, depends on the timeline. I'm trying to think how long I haven't been teaching in 230. Anyway, this was out front, and it was actually a great example to talk about rust. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So, so Ron is is uh, is kind of famous for his spiky and dangerous things, but also for his kinetic, um, <laughs> his kinetic sculptures. So you can see in the top right that that uh, that mantis. Um, there are bearings on the arms so that those arms can spin. So that they're they're very precisely weighted, um, and uh, and the bottom right. The hanging daggers can swing as well in the wind. We, um, when we lived in Pickering, kind of at the uh, the walk that we did, we were right by the end of Liverpool, and right down at the end of Liverpool, there was a Ron Baird sculpture. And um, in the wind, it's dynamic. It was so finely tuned, but also had basically it was a two mast dampener essentially. That even on the windiest days, it sped up but it was still a slow yeah. movement and then its momentum would pick up and it would keep going and then the wind would make it go back um so as much as they were responsive to the elements they weren't um it wasn't immediately perceived to be that tied in mm -hmm. to the wind it was pretty pretty spectacular this is so Ron and, and janet um it's it's about that that kind of intuitive understanding of the of the frequency of motion that make people comfortable and, the, and that don't and that make people uncomfortable. So, yeah. so if um, you know if if Janet's nets were stiffer and started to flap instead of flowing, then then they wouldn't be the same. You yeah. know, and if and if Ron's as well, like you're saying that that it was spinning sails and in, in Pickering, if they uh, if they spun at, at a different speed, then they would make people uncomfortable instead of. Um, instead of happy. Yeah, it didn't respond like a wing sock. Yeah, that's right. Um, this was 
way, way back. This was in the very first Nuit Blanche. So Adrian Blackwell, um, popular Toronto artist, also the son of Walter Blackwell, who was Dave's former partner before he retired. Is um, that Adrian in the bottom left? One with the toque? Might be. Adrian's a prof at, uh, U of, at uh, Waterloo as well in the architecture faculty. Yeah, that looks like it might be him yeah. taking uh, a picture. Yeah. Um, and so he has um, kind of a series of these art installations. So like I said, this was the very first Nuit Blanche. Um, and he got kind of one of the sweet spots to do his art installation. And it was just a circular ramp that went up and changed. And it was basically three circular ramps that moved at different rates. So you could step off of one onto another. Um, it's just making me think what a fun small scale thing to build for the kids in the backyard. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about building a, yeah. we're going to build um, um, balance basically beam. a balance beam circuit around the perimeter of our property. This would be a fun thing to do kind of in yeah. the middle, yeah. just somewhere randomly within it. Um, and so this was realistically how many people will get on this thing. And um, at the time, nobody really knew how popular Nuit Blanche would be. Like it was, will there be five people on this? Um, you can see that in the end that there was a lot of people on it um, and so 4.8 kPa became the right loading solution for this installation and so I know he has a series of these now kind of for different different installations the alien creatures by blue Republic the reason we're you know we're, we're trying to illustrate different techniques as well as um, structural challenges these ones were, were both cast and cut from plate. So the, the blue and the yellow elements are, are cast bronze that were then painted. Um, Why bronze if they were painted? Uh, I think it is a cheap way to do castings. Okay, okay. so I, I did know that it's cheap as like um, uh, wax, wa uh, the wax yeah. cast, um, like a wax wax casting. Um, but I'm, I'm just surprised at this scale, it's still the cheapest. Yeah, yeah. And, and durability well, and interesting. What would you do? It would be either be bronze or aluminum, I suppose, mm -hmm. yeah. if it's a metal, or you do yeah. it in, in, in some sort of plastic. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think it was the least expensive. The you know challenges with things like this are our are, are assembly. So you know these are not um, cast as a single piece. They're cast as multiple pieces that have to be assembled on site uh, in a way that's invisible. So there's... You know, there's invention of um, of kind of concealed fasteners or, or connection systems becomes the challenge. So you know, the the yellow one, for example, if you get underneath, there's a little access hatch, and buried inside there's a connection that's just uh, and it's just big enough to get people's hands in there. So I'm assuming this was cast with a slight hollow that allowed tabs or something to connect them together. That is right. Yeah. And then, how were these fastened into the ground? Do you know? This it wasn't was, your project, but you kind of... You know, to be honest, yeah, I was actually heavily involved in it, and I do not remember. <laughs> <laughs> this was being designed, was this what, around the time you were hit by the car? Yeah, maybe were, that's You that's spent right. a large portion of this time unconscious. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that's... That's all you have to say on yeah. that. So and a similar, like aesthetically, or a similar design idea is this, this um, sculpture by uh, Lux Mea uh, called Plethora. Um, you, you guys didn't do this, did you? No, we didn't no. do but this. But you've done work with Lux Mea. That's right. And we worked with Steve Avis a bit. He's a really sweet, sweet guy. Um, and uh, his whole thing is about 3D printing and 3D printing in metal. So, um, so they are kind of the cast connects of the 3D printing world, but they're also artists, so they develop this. And, and uh, you know, this is almost a, how complicated a thing can you possibly build? And, and, uh, and came up with this extraordinary, extraordinary sculpture, uh, 3D printed in stainless steel. Um, so the different kinds of challenges we face, this, this uh, Mirage by Paul Raff hung underneath the gardener, as you can see. Um, we probably spent about four hours engineering and 40 hours in meetings with the transportation department, um, uh, convincing them that 
this thing, which weighs probably two pounds a square foot, wasn't going to compromise the gardener in some way. <laughs> <laughs> and they are, you know, there's um, one, one of the things we learn on this is, the, is that um, there are technical, technical constraints and ideological constraints, constraints and you cannot, you cannot clear an ideological hurdle with a technical solution, um, which is the problem. I mean, this, in this case, we managed to get over it, but, but uh, the bridge we were working on intended to be suspended from the gardener, pedestrian bridge. There was ideological opposition. They kept standing, like, um, erecting technical hurdles, and they'd wreck it, and we'd clear it. We'd, they'd erect it, and we'd clear it. And eventually, they just accepted the fact that, that there was no situation where they were going to approve suspending a pedestrian bridge from the gardener. Uh, notwithstanding that we could prove that it was fine, and um, and at that point there's nothing you can do. Um, this one, we managed to clear that hurdle. But we did, we did face it. the The response we got is, under no circumstances will anything ever be hung from the gardener. And then, and then we managed to clear that hurdle. And now between us, we've done several. Yeah. <laughs> So Cloud Gate by Anish Kapoor. I, I think of Anish Kapoor as a fabric guy, a tensile guy, but um, but you know artists are artists, and, and if you're good at complex geometry, you're good at complex geometry. Um, so we did not do. Neither of us did this project. Um, uh, oh no! You, no, go ahead. I have nothing to say. I don't know anything about it. Neither do I. <laughs> <laughs> but my guess is within this is a frame. Uh, a steel frame, and that the big challenge was laminating on. Uh, the, they might have even done something similar to what Sherry Boyle did. My guess, my intuitive guess, is that there's a steel frame inside this with foam panels that have thin panels of steel laminated on it, so thin that you can buff out even the seams and made a mirror finish. Hmm. And the reason I would guess that is simply because of that um, one bloor canopy where essentially the underside looks like this. This is mirror polished stainless. Mirror polished yeah. stainless. But it is adhered to something that is doing all the work. It's funny, I was going to guess that this was a heavier stainless steel that on a frame, as, as you suggest, um, and that all the joints are welded. Probably um, some of them field welded because they, they would have had to bring it to the site in pieces. They would have field welded and buffed out the joints. And well, if you and look that, at that you know, welding is gonna would warp so much, like that it would cause so much distortion um, for something of this scale. Like yeah. I'm just surprised that they'd be able to buff it out and flatten it out because it's it's um, not just it's not just polished, but it is smooth. Yeah. Um, Do you know the, the Henry Moore sculpture in uh, Grange Park? No. Um, probably. Probably you do for sure. Um, I don't find it. Anyway, um, it's it's not dissimilar to this, but it's bronze. Um, and you can see that it was, now it's cast, but it was cast in pieces uh, and assembled and welded and polished. The welds polished. Um, and uh, and you can see where the welds are. Um, but, they're, but they've been polished out and they're beautiful and it's all patina. That... So could we find the answer for you for this? For sure. We could have known the answer before we showed this to you. Um, but one of the reasons I purposely didn't find the answer and didn't even tell Dave I was doing this uh, was specifically so that we could have a conversation to show you that every problem can have multiple solutions. Um, and so for another engineer to come along and say, well, that's wrong, that's ridiculous, why would you do that? They don't know the evolution of the process that got you to that solution. Mm -hmm. um, and so every problem has multiple ways to tackle it. And Dave and I just presented two different ways that, you know, there might have been other constraints that made one of them better than the other. But looking at this like this, it's not clear. And at a certain point, you make a choice and you start pursuing that technique. If there's um, a major reason, you might switch course. Um, but both of those would have been valid yeah. ways to kind of go about this. You know what's interesting about this one? Look at it, how it's sitting on two points. So this one in the wind, if it actually did what the what the illusion is, in the wind it would rock and it would rock back. Um, so those points are are fixed from a um, they have moment fixity to keep this thing from rocking, um, and uh, and yet there's no visible connection, right? 
this might very well have been slotted on similar to your your um, to rods epoxy into bonnets. a frame of some sort. Um, and we have done uh, yeah, what's his name? We've done a number of sculptures with um, oh shit, uh, Bay and Bloor is one of the sculptures out in front of the. Uh, I don't know. Anyway, the, the, this was a sculpture that did a sculptor that has a number of big pieces in, in Toronto. Um, his name is going to come to me the second we turn the uh, turn the camera off. But it was all about that. How do you create the illusion of of, uh, of a cube sitting on an edge, leaning on another cube, which is also on an edge, and and the strategy there was to cantilever plates out and then slot the. Uh, the sculpture over the plate. So the bean, 168 massive steel plates, which were then fitted together and welded shut for a completely seamless finish. Inside it's made of a network of two large metal rings. The rings are connected via a, a truss framework, similar to a bridge. Yeah. So. Right. You, <laughs> <laughs> um. So this is this is Studio F minus. This is a, an installation for um, at um, Young Dundas Square. Young Dundas Square. So one of the things hung from Young and Dundas yeah. Square that you got a call. Hey, can we hang this from Young That's and right. Dundas Square installation? Yeah. And so these were all these were all balloons suspended on catenaries. We had to create a net over the um, uh, over Young Dundas, Dundas Square. But if you can imagine, if you just take a a cable from one end to the other and hang balloons on it in the wind, that thing is going to move a lot. Um, and we couldn't have that, so we um, we needed to laterally fix them in place. Um, and so what we did in this case is we created what, what we what we coined a tri-cat. Um, a catenary with three cables coming from it. So every one of these um, uh, every one of these rods comes down, and, and a, or every one of these ropes comes down to a point, and then a third one comes out. So at that point, it becomes laterally it's fixed space. in space. It's similar to what you do in the inverse for a mast up in the air. You need three guy cables coming out of it. Yes. So it's just the inverse of that system. And you guys did this because I didn't work on this project. Who didn't work on? Who did this if I didn't work on it? Uh, Mike Hopkins. Ah, that makes sense. I did thought it was before Mike Hopkins. Um, uh, you guys did this pre um, cable analysis software. Yeah, that's right. We did it by hand. So you did it by hand calculation, um, which seems, I don't know, what's the big deal? But cable analysis is actually really difficult. Um, it's iterative. Um, as you make small changes, it can have big impacts throughout your entire calculation. Um. The uh, the artist that I was thinking of is Kaso Elul. Can you see this one? Um, I can see it. That study model, uh, study model for that sculpture is actually sitting on Walter Blackwell's mantelpiece. It was a gift from Kaso after they finished the finished the project. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Another project. This is at Massey Harris Park by Brown and Story Architects, and and I am embarrassed that I do not remember the artist that collaborated on the. Um, um, on the chain links below. So, so Brown and Story were the architects for the um, uh, for the canopy. They also did Young and Dundas Square, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, and this had a number of interesting challenges. One of the challenges with this is how do we get the, those columns so slender? And uh, and the answer to that was, we say this is not a building. It has no windows. It has no finishes. It's not a building. We designed for one percent drift, and um, and that allowed us to get the columns down to the to the size. This that, probably would have gone well in our canopies and pergolas. Probably, yeah, I couldn't pressure. remember. Couldn't remember what it was called back then. Because it's very similar to um, the IQ Park yeah. installation I did. Yeah. Um, I think that's. So right. you designed it for strength to meet building code loads, um, but then for stiffness, you. You registered the fact that it had no finishes on it that could be easily damaged and used the appropriate criteria as you saw fit with the communication with the artist and architect. And this was one of those, Shan, where we, where we did exactly what you do, whereas we start by what is the conservative assumption 
we said let's put a roof on this because they may have a roof on it one day um, and uh, and size all the members and then and then test it against the architectural intent um, in that in this case it didn't satisfy the architectural intent it was too heavy and uh, so we went back and said okay well it's not going to have those um, it can never have a roof on it even accidentally um, and we took took all those extra loads off and lightened it up but but we do the same we start with the what is the conservative assumption test it against the architectural intent if it satisfies the intent then the conservative assumption is the right one if it doesn't then we then we uh, back off on that presumption uh, luminous veil this is uh, I think this is you know, people love it, people hate it. I think it's extraordinary. Certainly as a structure, it's extraordinary. Um, uh, as this, uh, this beautiful tensile net. Um, one of the, the really extraordinary things is, is that it was all done by hand. Um, Derek Revington and Jeff Toon working out all the details by hand. Um, and Marianne were building it. Um, and, uh, this was built before I moved to Toronto, so this was in the 90s, it was yeah. in the late 90s, but it was a new thing, so it was the late, late 90s. Yeah. Um, and, and one of my favorite parts of this is it's got these little lookouts and it's got a catenary cable, because it's all catenary cables, with a, with a prop pushing it out, so the catenary comes out and then comes back. And it just to me is the most like it is the most elegant and clever, simple detail. So the, the cable detailing is just gorgeous. It is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Um, and then since then, at the time, Derek Revington had always had this image of the light play on it. But they didn't have they had the, the technology to build the structure he wanted, but not the technology to do the lighting that he wanted. So he came back and they installed the lighting, which is responsive to um, the actual temperature and weather. Mm -hmm. uh, the lighting follows the, the actual external temperature and weather. Um, uh, that was installed in 2015, 2016, I think. So, you know, almost 20 year difference between the kind of the it, original portion of it and then the final kind of realization of the idea. Tensegrity. And I figured we'd end on this yeah, one yeah, because yeah, Dave, sure. well, we love tensegrity structures, but this is, uh, uh, we, we have yet to build a full scale, like a big structure on it, but we've both done, we've both done art installations that are tensegrity. Yeah, yeah I wonder. Do, oh, tell I... them what the definition of a tensegrity is. Well, tensegrity is a uh, structure is, um, is a, a, a series of plops, prop, plops, props floating in a, uh, a cable net where none of the compression elements just touch each other um, and, and only come down to the ground at very discrete points. So each prop is suspended in the air. So the cables can all be thin because they're only in tension. And then these elements are bigger because they're only in compression and they never touch each other. So they're only connected. The compression elements, you don't have anything up here with compression coming down to here, it transfers into something in tension before it can transfer into something in compression. Now, Kenneth Nelson and Buckminster Fuller both claim to have invented tensegrity, um, uh, but I don't know of any Buckminster fight, Fuller stuff fight. that was that was built, but Kenneth Nelson has done so many of these wonderful sculptures. And one of the interesting things about tensegrity is, is that people refer to it, you know, they, they applied for a patent and they thought it was going to be a building system and um, but it never, it never gained any traction um, because there was a perception that it was too flexible. Um, and yet, and I, I always wondered about that because it's all fully triangulated and a cable in tension that is pre-stressed is as stiff as a rod. It's, um, there is no loss of stiffness um, as a result. And then I realized that a cable if you do compress it, it goes completely slack, so it, it relies on the pre-stress. Without pre-stress, cable goes slack, the system is flexible, and, um, and the, the beautiful minimal detailing of the ends of these rods, where you don't see any fittings, um, the cable just slips around and, and down into the tube. It's impossible to pre-stress these cables. 
and without pre-stress, the system is extremely flexible. And, uh, and so the, the thing that makes it so sublime is also the thing that makes it not a great structural system. Um, now, having small kids, one of the things, like, we got 15 of them, I think, because people know we're structural engineers. Um, there's a Tensegrity toy that you can buy at Kohl's or Indigo or whatever. Mm -hmm. And what they actually do, even though they don't pre-stress it, but they only have like one or two pieces of elastic and it runs from piece to piece to piece. So if it was a structure, assuming you didn't have too sharp of a bend, you could imagine a way that maybe you could pre-stress at a discrete point. It wouldn't look like these beautiful, these beautiful art sculptures, but you could, you could start to imagine a way that you could detail it in a way that you could pre-stress multiple elements simultaneously. Um. Now, I say I never got traction as a structural system. There have been a number of extension domes, which are um, for stadiums, which are tensile, or they are tensegrity systems. That, that the, uh, it's a cable net with a series of, of props. And in fact, on a symbol in one of our schemes, it was, was a tensegrity scheme. Um, that sculpture I did for Nathan Whitford that was hung from uh, the gardener was a tensegrity structure. It was a reciprocal frame tensegrity structure hung from the gardener. Um, I, he, when I looked at it and told him that, he was like, well, you just made it even cooler. Because <laughs> he just knew it looked cool. He didn't even know kind of the, the implications of that. Yeah. And you, you have one or two, I thought you had one or two tensegrity structures on the go. Well, certainly we, we've done some fabric uh, tensegrity structure. So, so this is a, a flying know. mass. I think we did too, but I, I it's, it's not, not it's not coming to me. Yeah. Oh, we, no, we did with Adrian Blackwell, <laughs> <laughs> but we were unsuccessful. <laughs> um, uh, we did a, a competition um, for a sculpture in waterfront. So, guys, that is the very last slide of our very last lecture. Um, I just want to thank you guys for being a part of this course. Um, I, and bearing with us as, uh, you know, I, I try really hard, at, at least in the kind of more structured courses, <laughs> um, <laughs> okay. um, uh, to be very rigorous about the dates that these were set out. Um, for you guys, that kind of left you guys in the loop a little bit, and you guys have been very patient and wonderful with this. Uh, the models that you guys built, I was really very impressed. They're really, really cool models, and I can't wait to see... Um, images of the, the loading. If you want to make short um, kind of gifts or feedback images, but just short, I don't want, I don't want like um, 15 minute videos uploaded um, uh, just because I need to be able to kind of get through them all and give them the, the appropriate feedback. Um, so, you know, feel free to record your whole kind of failure process. Um, and then pick discrete elements that kind of, you can screen capture it um, so you don't have to kind of go through the process of uploading the whole thing. Um, uh, can't wait to see that. It's been wonderful to have uh, you guys with us. Um, on this journey. On this journey. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys were super patient because we had to make all, well, we made most of these lectures from scratch. Um, and so this course kind of being redone in the future would be building off a really strong platform that you guys were a part of letting us create. So thank you for that. And uh, for those of you that I won't see again, uh, it's been great. And have a great career. And hopefully you'll reach out to one of us for something as you go to build it.